And good evening, it's February 15th, 2024. Welcome to another one of our Branches on the Vine with the Bible Project and the Sermon on the Mount series. So the Bible Project, they created this series to cover the entire year, right? Every five weeks, they're going to release another episode. And we're going to take some time to discuss each of these videos and the creative topics that they choose to present. Um, these videos uh, that we're going to be discussing, they're just the tip of the iceberg. They are, they are part of a learning series that I highly recommend, and they all can be found on the Bible Project app. There's a link in the description. So, welcome this evening to episode two of the Sermon on the Mount. This is who the kingdom of God starts with on the dusty feet. And before we forget, if you find these kinds of podcasts useful, then click the subscribe button. The reminders, they just help you. But also, if you think you might find these useful to others, let's just click that like button, because that is the way that YouTube chooses to share these to more people, if they wish. This uh, Sermon on the Mount, again, it's found in Matthew 5-7. through And again, for me, it is the seminal moment in the teachings of Jesus. This is his longest, deepest, widest teaching that we have recorded in Scripture. It covers things that we, for sure, we love to talk about. Yet deep down, we really have challenges accepting and living. The Sermon on the Mount, Episode 2. This is who the kingdom of God starts with. So let's watch the video and see where it takes us. Enjoy. Two thousand years ago, on the eastern side of the Mediterranean Sea, a teacher named Jesus of Nazareth went up onto a hillside and addressed a large crowd. It was a crowd of nobodies, poor and sick people, their land occupied by the Roman Empire who charged heavy taxes. This is a ragtag group. And while they don't look like much, Jesus claimed that something surprising was starting with them. So he opened his mouth and said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of the skies. The kingdom of the skies? What does that mean? Well, Jesus uses this phrase to talk about a new kind of reality. From our perspective, we see a world of violence and corruption where might makes right. But for Jesus, there is a realm where generosity reigns, where there's justice and peace. It's a world where love is the final word. And that reality might as well be up in the skies. It's beyond us. Exactly. It's God's heavenly reality, which might seem far off. But Jesus was claiming that heaven was coming to earth right here and now, beginning with these people. That's unexpected. And so is what he says next. Blessed are those who grieve, for they will be comforted. So this group that's at the bottom of society, they know all about loss and grief. But Jesus said, something's coming that's going to turn sorrow into joy. And then he said, blessed are the unimportant, for they will inherit the land. And these people are not powerful or important, but just wait, Jesus says, because one day it will be you all who are ruling the world. You know, it kind of sounds like Jesus is trying to start a revolution. Well, kind of, but it's not a revolution for those who are hungry for power or influence. This is a movement of people who are going to serve because they long for healthy relationships between people and communities and nations. Yeah, as Jesus puts it next, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Just imagine it, a group of powerless nobodies ruling the world through generosity and forgiveness and justice. This is a Jesus-style revolution. The next thing Jesus says is, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And this one really raises the bar. To be part of this revolution, my heart needs to be so pure I could look directly at God? Well, Jesus knows that all of our choices, even our good ones, are often driven by mixed motives. For Jesus, real peace is only possible through people who know that they need to be transformed if they're going to truly love God and others. And this sounds wonderful, but it's a radical calling. 
That's exactly right. In fact, Jesus goes on to explore just how radical it is. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. So God's new reality won't just happen by itself. It requires people who are willing to enter into the conflicts of others, urging and helping create a way towards peace. But that way of life can be dangerous. And so Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of the skies. Yeah, entering into conflicts and advocating for peace, that's not a comfortable way to live. And so Jesus calls the people to this peacemaking revolution and he names the high cost. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in the skies is great for they persecuted the prophets who were before you in the same way. What does that mean, the prophets before you? Well, Jesus and this whole crowd are Israelites. And in their Hebrew scriptures, God promised that it would be through Israel that his kingdom would be restored over all the world. But as the story goes, Israel becomes as corrupt and violent as everyone else. And they end up enslaved to oppressive nations. But Israel's prophets stood up to these kingdoms and criticized their corruption. They said that one day God's heavenly kingdom would break in, starting with a small group of Israelites who would be willing to surrender everything over to God. So Jesus wants this crowd to see that they're part of that legacy. Yes, and that's why Jesus concludes this first block of teaching with three images from their scriptures. The first is, you are the salt of the land. Salt is a mineral that preserves food for a long time. And in the Bible, salt is used as a symbol of God's long lasting covenant with Israel. Jesus is saying that he and this ragtag group are the launch party of God's long lasting ancient promises to renew the world. And then Jesus says, you are the light of the world and a city on a hill cannot be hidden. He's referring to the biblical image of God's light, his presence shining out from its dwelling place in the temple in Jerusalem, which was a city on a hill. But these people, they aren't the rulers. I mean, they don't even live in Jerusalem. And yet, surprise, Jesus says, you all are God's salt and city and light. You all are the blessed ones, the new Jerusalem that's going to display God's kingdom to all the world. Now, how can a group of nobodies who follow Jesus become the beginning of a whole new world? Well, Jesus is gonna help them reimagine who God is, who we are, and how we should live and treat other people. That section of the Sermon on the Mount is what we're going to look at next. So, what'd you think? So one of the things that I find so engaging with scripture um, is the constant thought of looking back, right? Um, we're supposed to look back. That's mostly encompassed by the phrase, we're remembering things, yeah? Um, and in that sense, that might be a, uh, a hearing experience. In the present, and what does it, so we hear these things. So in the present, I want to say this right. Um, what does that have to do in relation to the past? In other words, if I'm hearing things, remembering things, does that have any bearing at all? Right? So I think back to the Hebrew scriptures. Okay. Let's take a quick side note. Um, cause I think it's relevant. So I hear them. And I'm not sure if it's intentional or not to refer to these as, as their scriptures. So I would maybe uh, propose a uh, paradigmatic shift, right? Let's adjust our phraseology to 
our scriptures, right? Because this really is our story. We're only here because of the stories and the people contained in these scrolls, yeah? Think about that. So, back to our story. Uh, wait, wait, okay. <laughs> One more thing. Because it falls under expectations, right? Stories are really part of the double content, right? The story of what happened at the time and the actors and the actions that followed and what they did at that time. Mm -hmm. Then we have us reading it, hearing it. And now we have other stories and other e information to relate to that other story. So how will I respond to the information shared in these stories? Because now, knowing at least what I think I know, or at least that I'm trying to understand, yeah? Make sense? We are hearing about what they did. And you're going to see where this fits. Now, I know that we know that we think we know what we think we know, yeah? And yet we've seen what they did in the past past, and then what they did in their future, we're going to get there because this is relatively speaking. And then how is that going to help me apply to where I'm at today? Okay, so now here's one of the fun and I interesting parts for me. And it, it's that kind of thought line that I just mentioned, that can go back to them as well. Hear me out. See if there's any relevance. These folks here on the mountainside, right? So it's called the Sermon on the Mount. So... Work with me here. These uh, lost sheep of Israel, these children that are the descendants of Abraham, they have a story that they can look back on, that they could use uh, to see what they're connecting, right? Even uh, maybe even a deja vu kind of thinking. Because this rabbi, this prophesied Messiah, this is the one that's also called a prophet likened unto Moses. So maybe now there might be more resembling context than you might have thought. Because he's speaking to them on the hillside about the kingdom of God. So Tim and John opened the door on this. Seems fair that we can wander through. Torah, the basis of God's kingdom, the foundation, as it were, the beginning. So we're at an event, at least from my personal paradigm perspective anyway, this is as impactful as the visit at the foot of Mount Sinai. And I think even more so when it's viewed as a, uh, as a connected event. So um, in today's vernacular, we might even call it a, a sequel, where we need part one in order to really understand part two. Because without part one, we can come up with all kinds of reasons and things to say about part two. It has no context to be framed in. So now, maybe, let's frame part two under the context of part one. That part one just sets us up for what comes next. In all of the other scrolls um, that, that followed the Torah, right, that are contained in, in part one, all of those other scrolls are the story as to how we got to the foot of another mount, right? Uh, as the Bible Project likes to say it, the story that leads us to Jesus. And this is the sermon that follows. So I'm proposing that this is a sequel. That means that the folks in the story, well, they're also part of the original story. So we've entered the realm of, you've heard this, and... Um, we hear this more than a few times because Jesus is basing all that he will address on, on two things, really. What was told to you, your ancestors at the Mount, and also what the teachers of the day are telling you to do based on what was told to you at the Mount. You know, it goes along with Jesus telling the same crowds, listen to what they say from the seat of Moses, right? That's remembering the Torah yet don't do as they do. I have a different way. So Torah, listen to it. Just don't follow their example. 
what they tell you to do. Let's revisit what that's going to look like for us. Because all of this is based on what was told you in part one, the points that Jesus brings up. All of them are in relation to what was passed down at the other mount. We covered this point a bit in the chiastic conversation video, and I think it applies here. Um, this story can only be framed in the context of the other mount, because without it, and the promises of God made there, then this isn't going to make any sense. So, um, the other sermon on Mount Sinai, that is what this sermon is overlaying. It's building on top of that. One could use a term like fuller, or in my head, giving possibly more of a uh, 3D shape. We're adding form, right? I kind of like fills in the picture. It's fuller. It gives it depth, width, and height. Uh, a fuller picture. I guess you can see where I'm segueing here. The fulfilled picture. What it can and maybe will look like. But we're only building on the base, the foundation, the framework, the skeleton. And we're adding, metaphorically speaking, meat to those bones. You know, it's fair to say that the folks then, I guess one could say probably us now, we should be a bit more mature than they were or we are. Heck, even Paul talked about that one. So if we can attempt to keep that in mind, then we see the things that Jesus will address. Um, what you've been told in reference to the mount, yeah? And why you've been told about that and how to act based on that, right? Because then we might have a different lens to view these teachings as we move forward. It could be an in interesting journey with this, right? Because I think it's going to be fair to see if what I'm postulating holds up or not, right? Are we willing to see if there's a different way to start looking at this series of teachings? One man, chosen of God, to deliver a message. Another man, given by God, chosen to deliver a message. Both from God. Both do his, both um, to the chosen people. Both are expected to live it as an example and let the world see the light and uh, taste the salt. So as we start this sermon, Jesus begins with some points that we like to call, we like to call the Beatitudes, right? These series of blessings. I like to start with something I call compare and contrast. You know, if we're going to use the story of the children of Israel at Mount Sinai as our part one, the setting and the framework, um, they're going to be the source of much of the uh, compare and contrast. So let's get the obvious out of the way, right? Uh, we have the same children of Israel in both places at the foot of mounts. We have prophets at each. They're both speaking for God. They're relaying his will to the people. We have folks that have been uh, and or are <laughs> in an oppressed state. Ones that have lost the identity, in a sense, of who they are. In the first mountain, he was setting up, establishing them. In the second, maybe it's just to remind them that they, they've been here before. Because this kingdom of God, this establishment of a kingdom, we definitely get that in the first mount. God was giving them the groundwork for a kingdom that would exist under his auspices. His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So God's people, the ones that would carry out this way of life, this example, this light, this salt of the earth, they were back then, and they are the now part of the story. And as I've said, since the story's not finished, all has not been accomplished yet, we are now part of that story too. See, we have some more. Um, God let it be known from the beginning that these people, that they had not earned the merit of being chosen, that they were chosen merely because God chose them, fractured and frail as they were. God had found a man, and from God's perspective, 
he found him to be righteous. And uh, he chose to bring these people from him, right? These were going to be his descendants. Even in that story, this it's abundantly clear that even the beginning needs the direct interaction from God, a, a miraculous beginning, because we get a child from a nearly 90-year-old woman. It's hard to not see God's involvement there. So God makes a covenant with Abraham. And in those promises, in that covenant, the world would be blessed. The whole world. The, the impact of descendants of Abraham would be felt throughout all of the generations of the world. These people, chosen by God in an oppressed state, they don't feel very important. They don't feel very special. They don't feel very set apart. They might even be doubting themselves. They're not feeling it. And Jesus starts out the sermon with whom God says, who he deems, who he views as blessed. And those they are and will be part of the kingdom. You know, in the words of King David, these people are that they're they're seen, right? They're seen by God. They're they're getting his full attention. His face is towards them. Blessed are they. And in this list of folks that uh, no one else seems to be viewing them the way God's viewing them. These folks, they're in a way the same. These same broken, scared, viewed as nothing but slave labor people. God will begin a kingdom with them again. We see this reflected in these very Beatitudes, the folks that others did not hold in high regard. God, he has a different view. Echoes of the mountain. Yeah, you know, yet we also, we have a departure in a sense, right? Because um, they're not entering to take over a land that God had prepared for them. This was not a power move. This was actually to start the same way Jesus started. And he gave us an example. His life. I want you to remember this for later, because I'm going to put it out there for discussion at a, at a later date. But did anything that Jesus told them to do, even these beatitude attributes, right, that Jesus did not do in his own life example? Jesus actually lived what he taught. And this was unlike what the Pharisees were doing. Food for thought. Because our behavior is not of a uh, conquer to enter a land. Just read the Beatitudes. It's anything but. <laughs> and we're just getting started with this Sermon on the Mount. This is not the conquering king and kingdom that they expected even at that time. Again, very different from what they uh, had not been told or what they had heard it said. But these are things that I even struggle with, yeah? Because it seems that folks want to, uh, they want to call on the power of God for judgment and requests. They, they want to be the spear of that power and judgment. Yet that's not what Jesus would do to, uh, or what would be uh, these um, identifiers of those that are part of, maybe we could say citizens of, this kingdom of God. You know, I can say, at least for me in my lifetime, these 63 years, that while in education, the, uh, the descriptors used in the Beatitudes, they are seldom, if ever, part of the, uh, the way to be successful, the way to be rich and powerful, right? To enjoy the power. Yet these, these almost attributes, we can agree, though, that they are actions, that God finds favor in those actions. He finds them acceptable in his kingdom. 
we have these, uh, these beatitudes. And yet, to have these be a part of us, these actions, these life choices, we have a life lived behavior example. So now, here comes the uncomfortable question, probably not unexpected, yet it will most definitely push a popular paradigm perspective. Are there any instructions in Torah that would go against, cause us not to live, as a start, any of these beatitudes that have been proposed? Is there any part of Torah? And I'll even give us a current context, since we're here, right? This is, is there any part that would cause us not to reflect any of these beatitudes in our context? Because I posed this question before, so might as well pot out again. Is there any instruction in Torah that we are incapable of doing? Let's remember the context. Since we're in the here and now, this is fair, right? There's no tabernacle, there's no temple, there's no priesthood. And since the sacrifices are, are tied to those two, yeah? So that's an obvious delineator. Those don't. And remember, God caused that, or as a minimum, allowed that, because Jesus even talked about it. And since I'm a man, those instructions that apply to uh, to women, well, they don't apply to me. And for those that are women, well, it's the other way around. Even within that context, I've asked for about a decade now this same question. What's too hard? What's, what's too difficult? That God made it impossible to do. He set us up. What doing and living the Torah is inconceivable. I've, I've yet to have a single response. No one has found one yet and told me about it. So I'm just going to ask you the same question. Um, we have been told, we have been told that these instructions are either too hard, impossible to keep, or bad now. Is it inconceivable to be able to think that we could do them? Or being told it's inconceivable to think that we could do them. I've been on a journey of seeing what we've been told and seeing if it's actually true. Jesus is addressing these kinds of issues, these kinds of being told that needed to be readdressed. This is a real challenge, and I mentioned this in, in the beginning, and I'm likely going to be saying it many more times on this journey. Because we like to read these kinds of texts. We love to hear Jesus teach. Even if those back then, I would suspect. And yet, as we'll see not only in some more of the teachings of Jesus as, as well, as with us too, we're really not sure if we're willing to live it. Do we really want to be what these descriptors seem to be painting a picture of? Do we really want to look and act like that? The sermons on both mounts, these two events, they're asking folks to be representatives of God, right? To display his ways, his light, his flavor to the earth. We, at times, we talk about, and I heard them say, they failed. We've heard it many times. Yet, when I see our last 2,000 years plus in the mirror, how do I see a different picture? Let's be honest, brutally honest. Is it better? Same? Is it worse? I love this Sermon on the Mount, and I'm compelled that it cannot be fully uh, fulfilled without the other Sermon on the Mount. We need the echoes of that mount. It's not a them, us. It's more of a God, my Father, Jesus speaking, right? He gave you this, and now it's time to grow up. Things are going to change in a way that you probably cannot imagine. In ways that you might have thought you'd expected, but not yet, not at this time. 
Still, it's going to get bigger, wider, deeper than anyone has ever imagined. And I, it's Jesus talking, I don't have a lot of time to get you on track. So we're going to explore these teachings in this upside-down revolution. I know we're going to get there for sure. And it's going to look like none other in history. You know, in the, uh, in the immortal words of Vinzini from Princess Bride, inconceivable. He didn't fall? Inconceivable. You keep using the word. I don't think it means what you think it means. <laughs> I think maybe we need to rethink a few things. I, and we're going to be looking at this entire series through that lens. Is it really inconceivable? So, as you can tell, I'm, I'm real excited about this series. And tomorrow, we're going to be discussing this part two video with my cool brother, Jim Wern. Because we're going to be exploring even more thoughts that come up along the way as we enjoy our chat. Remember, in the description below is a link to the folks of the Bible Project and a link to the app so you can follow along and see each one as they premiere and the additional topics that they discuss. This will continue to be an exciting and thought-provoking journey into the Sermon on the Mount, because I wonder what we're going to continue to uncover. So, thanks for with us tonight with the Sermon on the Mount series on another edition of The Dusty Feet. Thank you.